Hey everyone, Genome here. Come at you with the next episode in my interview series. Uh, this is the series where I take a look at people who do interesting and or extraordinary things. And uh, the, the whole purpose of this series is not only to show people the interesting or extraordinary thing that people do, but to learn about the people who are behind said thing. So uh, today's guest comes uh, to us all the way from... Uh, uh, Austin, Texas. So he's 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 a little bit away from me in here in uh, wet and cold West Virginia. Uh, today's guest is Rob Clark of uh, Venetox Laboratories. Uh, Venetox Laboratories is a venom extraction site, and uh, as you or excuse me, business. And as you know, I have a uh, penchant for interviewing people who do venom extractions. I've uh, interviewed Jack Vicente, uh, Kristen Wiley, Jim Harrison. So some of the big players I have in the industry, and I have some others lined up for next time I go to Florida. Uh, like Carl Barden and George Van Horn. So, uh, yeah, so it's been my goal to try to talk to all of these guys in this amazing field. So, uh, Rob, how are you doing this fine day? Great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you uh, coming on the show and taking time out of your no-doubt busy day. So, uh, Rob, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Well, um, uh, I, I could talk, I guess, for a long time about my personal history. I don't know what everybody wants to know. Um, you know, I, I wasn't always involved in uh, the reptile industry. I didn't have a ton of that background under my belt when I started out with this. Um, so I guess my origins are I, maybe a little different, but not too different. I mean, I was always obsessed with reptiles and uh, animals in general. Um, so... What else would you like to know? Well, uh, like, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, you know family, kids, um, that sort of thing, okay. personal stuff like that, where you kind of grew up, just real basic, quick stuff like that. All right. Um, you know, I grew up in the Mountain West, and I, I, I look back at my, uh, you know, my first grade journal entries in elementary school, and every single page has something to do with toads or snakes or lizards. And um, it was a fun, fun to look back at that because back then I had no idea that I would be you know, professionally involved with reptiles. But um, back then and then through high school and even college, I didn't even know that there were herpetological societies or other people that were upset, as obsessed with myself as myself. Um, and so I just kind of kept that obsession to myself. Yeah, whenever I ran off to grab a snake or look under something to see if there was a snake, everybody around me would be like, what's that weirdo doing? Um, so, yeah, I just kind of kept that obsession to myself. Um, it wasn't until I was married that I kind of became more true to myself and more true to what I really wanted to do in life. I was I I got into medical sales, and I did that because I really enjoyed talking to people. I enjoyed the idea of helping people or whatever. But it wasn't, I think something that I really felt passionate about and I still wanted to be passionate, do what I could be passionate about. And I remember specifically having a conversation with my wife because she was getting kind of frustrated that I was spending so much time researching snakes. And she's like, you have a job, you got to take care of your family. And so I guess back to, you know, my family, I, I do have three kids. Um, I'm getting used to saying four because we are adopting um, another one, and that's fun um, and a little bit scary sometimes. But um, so my wife was, you know, you got kids and a family to take care of, and you're sitting here researching snakes. And I thought to myself, and I asked her, so what if I was researching snakes and it had to do with my job? And she said, well, that would be totally fine. And that's kind of when, really? Okay. And that's when the wheels started to turn. And I had, I guess, an epiphany and a life 
changing moment right there. But that was one moment that kind of changed the trajectory of my focus in life. Um, but that was still always in the back of my head. I thought, okay, having a job that has to do with snakes, that's still kind of a pipe dream. And that's not, you know, what a mature father does. Um, so I kind of let that be put on the back burner for a long time. And then I had um, my oldest son, after he was in first grade, we realized that he had autism. And that was kind of life changing. I wasn't sure how to be a father to a kid with autism. But going through a period of time where I thought my kid just didn't like me or, you know, because people with autism don't typically make contact or have a lot of communication with you, obviously. So I thought, well, my son doesn't like me or whatever. And then after learning and researching much more about autism, I, I learned that I needed to join his world and have more to do with what he's interested in. And my interests involve the outdoors, animals, and biology, and sports. I love sports. I love baseball and football and any other sport. I just like being outdoors and moving around, whatever. But my son didn't like sports. He liked Star Wars, and he liked the outdoors and biology and reptiles. And so we did have an intersection of interests with the biology reptiles and the outdoors. And I realized that that's where our two worlds can intersect. And so that's, I kind of went full bore in that direction. Uh, growing up, I always wanted to be a wildlife biologist and through college and whatever, that dream just didn't come to fruition. I, which is okay, you know. I ended up with a degree in marketing, which is totally different from what I do. And my wife is the one that had the degree in marketing. I am sorry, the degree in biology, and now her degree is in marketing. <laughs> I mean, now she works in marketing, and my degree was in marketing, and now I work in biology. So we kind of swapped roles there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in starting... Venatox, uh, part of that goal was with Hayden in mind. Hayden is my son, and we weren't sure what he would do um, later in life. He's incredibly intelligent. He gets good grades and stuff, but uh, wanted to create something that if he was passionate about it, passionate enough about it as well, he could join me with the work. I don't know that I feel comfortable with him extracting venom. I don't know whose parent would be comfortable yeah. <laughs> with him extracting venom. <laughs> but there's a lot that he can do, and I just love having him around. He's a ton of fun to go herping with and go look for snakes or whatever. You know, it's kind of funny. It seems like there is almost like an unseen hand pushing you in this direction almost your entire life. So, I mean, first you start with the interest in your youth. I was the same way. I used to go out hunting for snakes all the time. I was the only one that did it. No one else cared to do it. The best they wanted to do was go look at a ball python in a, in a pet shop or whatever. But so, yeah, I wanted to go out and find snakes in the wild. But I mean, you see, so you had that going for you. And then um, you find out your career is not as satisfying as you as you think you might want it to be. And it gets you thinking about snakes again. And then and then you mention a little something to the wife. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, the, the bell rings. And it's like, okay, maybe I can do this for a living. And then you also find out that your son has a, a, a really extreme interest in reptiles. And so it's like step after step after step seems to be gently pushing you in the direction that you went. So I mean, that's kind of, it's a really interesting way of, of getting into the field. Yeah. So you, you touched on a little bit, uh, you were basically in medical equipment sales, correct? Before you got into the extracting game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it wasn't all that. Uh, you said, I mean, you said you did pretty well at it, but, um, it just wasn't fulfilling for you. Yeah. I mean, there are different facets to that that I loved. Um, I loved going around to different hospitals, talking to different people. Um, I really like people. I'm, um, I love animals, but I love people too. <laughs> um, so I love getting to know and, and talk to other people. That was really fun. Um, all the medical equipment was really fascinating to me, how the, the surgical instruments 
work or, or this retractor system work to open up, you know, a body so that they can operate on it. That was all really fascinating and I really enjoyed it. Sometimes you get a little bit jaded when um, companies make certain decisions that uh, might be more beneficial for, you know, stock shareholders, but not as beneficial for patients or doctors. And that's frustrating. Um, and, you know, so you try not to get cynical about that. At the same time, I was also spending a lot of time on the road and not spending much time with my family. And, and these are crucial years for toddlers and elementary school kids to have their dad pay attention to them. And I would be on the road a couple days a week. And then when I was home, I was on the laptop emailing and taking care of administrative duties and still not paying enough attention to my family. So I think that my family was struggling at that time too. So I just felt like, man, if there's some way that I could have my own business and uh, be there more often. But, you know, that's life too. It's so hard if you want to make a living and take care of your family you got to work a lot. <laughs> and so finding that balance is hard for everybody. My heart goes out to dads and mothers who work their butts off just to make ends meet. And then those who, yeah, you know, finding the balance of being home but not making enough or always working, it's hard for everybody. So anyway, it's, it's, it's interesting how that dynamic unfolds for everybody in their individual lives. Yeah, it's it's yeah. like I said back when I worked in telecom, I was on the road, you know, every other week. I'm for, all week I was gone constantly. It's very hard, even as a single person back then. It was very hard to maintain relationships with friends and family. I can imagine, you know, having a full family at home. I mean, that's it's it's, it's difficult and it's it's hard to juggle that. And it further makes things really scary when you want to branch out and try this new thing, like you did. It's like. I have a family depending on me, uh, you know, can I do this? It, that just ratchets up the fear factor, I'd say, in any kind of endeavor like that. Yeah, um, really, really, because um, there is another part of my brain, and rightly so, thinking, Rob, is this just totally selfish, you know? Are you doing this to help your family? What is the benefit to your family, and what if you get bit, and what if this all fails? You know, you could really hurt your family that way. And that was, that scared me far more than picking up any venomous reptile. Um, signing the lease for the warehouse to begin things was the scariest point of this whole endeavor. That was frightening. <laughs> thinking about it really was me kind of, uh, I get anxiety just thinking about it. I, I can only imagine, like I said, I, I'd never really been in that situation. I, I've opened my own business before, but I already had another job at two at the time. So I had my fallback and my wife works and makes pretty good money and all that too. So, but it was, uh, yeah, it's always scary when you have family and people depending on you. So, uh, how long has Ventox been in operation? Um, we're closing in on, uh, the beginning of the eighth year, um, I'm not sure if my math is right, but it's been seven, about seven years since I've begun producing venom. Um, I, I guess the transition from the medical world, uh, medical sales world, um, it, it was kind of a long, I mean, it seemed long transition. Um, my wife, I was without a job in uh, 2000, you know, after 2008, 2009, and so I was interviewing with a ton of different companies that seemed like perfect jobs. And I'd get to the final interview and things just weren't working out. And my wife said, look, Rob, you know, you had this dream about snake venom. Why don't you build a business plan for that? And we'll sell the house. We'll move to our uh, little townhouse. And I will go back to school and be a science teacher. And you take care of the kids while you build your business plan. And we'll go from there. And so that's what we did. Uh, my wife went to school and I was a stay-at-home dad trying to build this business plan. And 
um, I, I spent two full years just feverishly and obsessively studying everything there was to learn about venom, handling venomous reptiles, about the market um, that there is about venom, about keeping reptiles in general, herp herpetology, zookeeping, everything that you could possibly think of, that, that I could possibly think of, I was studying. And one of the challenges was that I was in Colorado. And in Colorado, it's not legal to keep venomous snakes. So there were no mentors. There were no resources for me locally to learn from. So that was a challenge, um, but luckily we live in the information age, and there's a lot of information that was available. Uh, you can go on Amazon and order any book you want, um, and then do all kinds of Google research, um, and then with Facebook and Facebook groups, uh, you can follow and learn about different things. There's a lot of cool Facebook groups. Uh, having to do with uh, venomous herpetology and snake bite and a myriad of things involved with that. Yeah, it's amazing how much information is out there now for even the layperson to go out and learn. So, I mean, it definitely helps. <clears throat> in, in the olden days, you had to have a mentor, really. I mean, I'm sure it's the best way to come up, but now there's so much of, of information just available to anybody with, you know, a computer access or even of just a phone nowadays that it, uh, it really helps things like that along. So... How many uh, specimens do you keep at uh, Venatox on the Venom line? I have about um, 220 snakes. Um, I probably extract from about 200 of them. Uh, there's probably about 20 or 30 who are juveniles I don't extract from or are non-venomous that I keep um, for a couple reasons. One, well, maybe I guess three reasons. <laughs> One is for my children. Uh, two is for anyone that comes to visit. Um, it, it's so much fun to pull out a Doomroll's boa or a king snake or a Transpecos rat snake and let these kids hold them uh, or their mom who's never held a snake and she's just scared to death. So there's uh, One of my favorite things in the world is getting someone to the lab who is terrified of snakes and has never held a snake. They won't even take a step into the lab, but then with some gentle coercion, they get into the lab and before they leave, they've got a doom rolls boa around their neck and they're like, you know what? I just faced my fear and I, it gives them some courage <laughs> and they learn a little bit more about snakes and they go from being frightened or having a kind of a dislike for reptiles to, Hey, I understand more about these animals. I understand how much my kids love them and that's okay i don't need to teach them to be afraid one of my favorite parts so um and then the other thing is that i think that you know i try to keep a level head about the the venomous snakes that i have in my care and keeping my part of keeping myself safe is just recognizing what their potential is um, because I've, I've never been bit, I don't know, I, I don't have that experience to draw upon to help me respect them at all times. And so I, I'm constantly looking at pictures of snake bites. I'm constantly, you know, watching and keeping my ears open about every snake bite that ever occurred and reminding myself, this could be you tomorrow. <laughs> And so I'll keep the non-venomous snakes also when I care for them and hold them. I can appreciate them and not feel any kind of, even if it's subconscious, a need to ever push the limits or boundaries to getting closer than I have to with the venomous snakes, which is kind of funny me saying so because I'm always, you know, pinning and holding them. But when it comes to not extracting venom, I still as far away as possible. I use two hooks whenever I handle a venomous snake, which I know for a lot of people is overkill. But my whole point is not getting bit. I mean, it seems like a reasonable <clears throat> precaution to me. I mean, you found something that seems to be working for you, so I, I have a, a hard time of 
imagine people giving you uh, <laughs> any kind of grief over it, you know. I guess maybe the, the longtime purist out there might look down upon it. It's like, oh, you'll need one snake hook for any snake. I mean, well, anyway. You, you've been hardcore in the business for eight, almost nine years now, and uh, or I'm sorry, uh, seven or almost eight years now, and you haven't been bitten. So obviously, what you're doing is working for you. So what's wrong with precaution? But yeah, so far, and I, I don't want anyone to think that that's something to boast about. Um, I, I the other guys, uh, Carl Barden and uh, Jim Harrison, have I'm sure had longer stints of not being bitten. So it's it's not anything to uh, get cocky about. I, I need to always remind myself, you could get bit twice next week. You know, you could get bit, go to the hospital, recover, come back, get going too soon, and get bit again. So there's no point in feeling overconfident about it. Um, it just is what it is. So I, I try to keep that in the forefront of my mind so that I don't get too relaxed. Yeah, and that kind of leads me to my next question is, you know, any people are creatures of habit. You know, any job you do it tends to wind up being kind of repetitive, you know, and you get kind of lackadaisical. You get a little lax in your safety. So how do you approach every day and every extraction at the top of your game to keep, you know, safety at the forefront to not – you know, take chances? I mean, is there like a mental prep you do before every extraction session or how do you maintain that focus at all times? Yeah. You know, I try to make sure that I, that I am just keenly aware of what my mental state is. If I'm feeling overly tired, then I'll take a nap. You know, if I didn't get enough sleep, then I will do a task that doesn't involve in extracting, you know, I'll process them or I will just clean, you know, there's, there's always cleaning to be done. Um, there's always something to, uh, to be worked on. I'm, I'm my own accountant. I'm my own janitor. I'm my own marketing guy. I'm my own everything. So there's always something to be done. Extracting is really only a, you know, maybe a quarter of what I do. Um, as far as preparation goes, um, making sure I'm in the mental state, making sure everything's cleaned up, making sure I know where all my equipment is, that nothing's out of place. Um, I think that I have a bigger chance of getting bit in the field, you know, where I'm turning over rocks or stepping, uh, you know, across a cliff or an outcrop where uh, a snake could be sitting and I don't see it that snake has more control over the environment than I do. Um, in my lab, I have all the control over the environment. I know where the snake is. I know where it's going to go. And I know where, you know, my own personal space is. So keeping my limbs out of its strike zone um, is quite easy. Um, it, it's that, it's those few moments where, my limbs are within the strike zone where I'm pinning him. My hand is reaching towards the snake. I have that snake, you know, I'm touching the snake, but don't have a full grip on it. Those moments, those are the crucial moments. And so if I'm in the right state of mind during those crucial moments, then, you know, I, I just focus on my state of mind. Yeah, it seems like once again, it seems like it's working for you. So, uh, sorry, I was getting a little feedback there. Um, so, you seem to specialize in Western Diamondbacks. Is that correct? That seems to be one of your main specimens. That's, that's the. I have more of those than any other specimens. I, I wish I was out in Florida and had more Eastern. I don't have any Eastern Diamondbacks. I'll probably get some eventually. But right now, that's definitely a specialty, and um, they're they're in my backyard here. So, um, yeah. So I, after about three years, I moved down to Texas, and that's been uh, beneficial. Now, is that because of their ease of access and getting the specimens, or is that more because of the demand for the venom is higher? Is there a reason why you specialize so much in those? Um. That's a good question. Uh, it's a combination of the demand of my customers and the ease of access. Those two things combined make for, you know, what naturally 
works best for my operation right now. All right. So uh, what other specimens do you house and, and extract from? Anything else, venomous, that is? I, I have copperheads and uh, cottonmouths, um, a few other species of uh, rattlesnake, but basically North American pit vipers is what I have. I don't do coral snakes. Um, the coral snake anti-venom is created with Florida coral snakes. They don't need any Texas coral snakes. So there's no point in my keeping those ones here. And they're hard to keep alive. Yeah, they, so they can be real venom. As much as I, I would love visitors to the venom or use them as kind of an educational specimen, it's it's just better to leave them in nature and let them live the way they live. <laughs> let them be. Now, I've watched uh, quite a bit of extraction footage from <clears throat> other other folks like you. And it looks like like the eastern dimebacks can be really a handful. Um, I, I don't know if you'd have any trepidation to work with them because they're so massive, as opposed to the westerns a little more. Uh, uh, do you? What's your thoughts on it? I, I mean, have you actually ever got to extract from an eastern diamondback? No, I haven't. Um, I think that physiologically they're very similar in build. Um, they just seem to be larger. I think that their behavior is different. Uh, it seems like eastern diamondbacks are much more calm. And a very, I, my biggest snakes are about five foot seven, five foot eight. Um, and once they get to be about that big, they're, a, they're pretty big snakes. You know, the, the, my biggest um, rattlesnake's head is about as big as my fist. And when you've got your hand on a snake that big, it can be a little bit intimidating because their musculature is amazing. Um, you know, physically, they're kind of like a long hose with a head and a tail. But when you open them up, you see that muscles go in every which way, in every direction. And that gives them the ability to do magical things when they're moving. <laughs> they can move in any direction uh, in a lot of different ways. They can amaze you. Um, and they're really, really strong. When they get in your hand, they can act like a limp noodle one moment and then throw themselves into a fit the next moment and rip themselves out of your grip. And so it's, it's the biggest challenge is, you know, you don't want yourself to get hurt, but you don't want to hurt the snake. But you have to grip them and control them with enough force so that they don't get out of your grip. Um, so using enough force to grip them and not hurt them is the balance. That's the, that's, that's the goal. Um, so Western Diamondbacks, back to the difference between Eastern and Western Diamondbacks, I don't have experience handling an Eastern Diamondback from what I have heard and what I've seen in them being handled. They do seem more calm, and my big – some of my big, calm Western Diamondbacks are pretty easy to handle um, when they're calm, um, but they're capable of doing uh, a lot of damage. They're capable of using <laughs> all their muscles to do to get themselves out of your grip. So that's that's kind of the scary part. Um, Western Diamondbacks can be a lot more spastic they are much more likely to strike. They're more likely to freak out. Um, but I don't know. I've never kept Eastern Diamondbacks. I haven't handled them. So uh, there could be um, someone else tell you, oh, Eastern Diamondbacks will really freak out on you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. I look forward to your asking that question to Carl Barton when you talk to him about Eastern Diamondbacks. Yeah, I've watched that. I know that. George Van Horn have a lot of experience with them. So. I just wonder if that'd be like a two man operation once they started getting over six foot or so. Because <laughs> for people who have never held a snake before and had one struggle against you, they don't realize how strong these things really are. And like you said, they can go in any direction. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, having, a, you know, if, if a, a Western Diamondback, hypothetically, were longer than six feet, or if it were an Eastern Diamondback longer than six feet, having someone else control the tail could be helpful. Um, some extractors will tuck the, uh, the tail between their legs 
or under their arm and I'll, I'll start with it under my with the tail tucked under my arm and if he gets an advantage then I'll go to, to between my legs with the really big ones um, but having someone else assist is a mixed bag because then your attention is even if it's subconsciously divided um, my focus I, I like having my focus entirely on the snake and not even being having to worry about there being someone else in the room. I know that others, and agreeably so, having someone else there is necessary to help you if you got bit. And I have people that work next to me um, just outside my lab. There's always someone right outside my lab that I'm friends with. And there's... Uh, there's a, the ER is exactly one mile from my lab, and I'm friends with the ER doctor there. I know them and have stayed in contact with them. So if something were to happen, I would be able to get there in plenty of time after having secured the snake and gotcha. taking care of it. I know there's there's tons of security um, precautions that need to be going through too. You need to have I don't know. Do you keep uh, antivenin on on hand? So, um, I only keep North American pit vipers, so the only anti-venom I would need would be something that treats North American pit vipers, which is stocked at the ER nearby. Um, the anti-venom has to be administered with a drip line and reconstituted with saline. Um, so, there's no point in my keeping it. Um, so I don't. I keep an EpiPen and a snake bite protocol just in case the uh, physicians need to reference that. Um, but the EpiPen, in case I do have a reaction, I don't know that I have an allergy to venom. I've never been bit. so And I don't seem to have any kind of reaction to venom when I'm working with it and processing it. Um, I do use, you know, goggles and a face mask and gloves when I am processing it or, or pack, packaging it, whatever. I try not to, you know, have it come in contact with my membranes, but you never know. So I try to take every precaution. Basically, worst case scenario, mm -hmm. always in the forefront and be prepared for that. Gotcha, gotcha. So, how many, on average, how many extractions do you think you go through a week? Hmm. I never really thought of it. Uh, well, maybe 150. I mean, that's not a lot. Uh, I, but then again, I do the extracting, I do the cleaning, I do the feeding, I do the veterinary care. Um, I do the processing and I do the packaging and then repeat. So I think with all of that, that does help me break up my day so that I don't go get in the zone of just extracting and then losing my focus. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll extract and then I'll do other things. So I'll extract, I'll take the snake out, extract, put it in the, in the can with the lid on it. They don't clean the enclosure, change the water, do anything else that needs to be done for it. If it needs any kind of uh, veterinary care, I won't do the extraction. I'll take care of the snake. Um, and then put the snake back in its clean enclosure. So that takes a little bit longer than just doing the extraction. Yeah, so a lot of people don't think about the husbandry when it comes to keeping of reptiles, especially that many specimens. Like, that's a full-time job in itself, just keeping the cages clean and the animals healthy and fed and all that. Yeah, that's that's a ton of work, especially for a one-man operation. In addition to that, I just try to make sure, you know, I think the number one part of my protocol is never being rushed. So, mm -hmm. and, and that is funny because my life has changed so much from being in, uh, you know, a a sales, a medical sales kind of position where your life is rushed. You're in a big hurry. You're driving faster, and you're in a hurry to get from point A to point B. 
now I drive like an old lady and I, I'm just never in a hurry anymore. And my wife is like, come on, come on, come on. And I'm like, what's the hurry? You know, I'm just never in a hurry anymore. And it's kind of uh, been nice for me mentally. I think. Yeah. It kind of slows you down out of the rat race a little bit, right? It <laughs> gives you a new appreciation for the color of the roses and the smell of the air. Right. Um, yeah. So just, just ballparking, how much do you think it would cost for someone to start up even a small venom extracting operation? That's a really good question um, because there are a lot of variables mm -hmm. and it would depend on what that person's goal was, you know, what niche in the market or what they wanted to focus on um, because their, the equipment costs are large um, the cost of renting a space or owning your own space is large. I imagine there's a lot of people out there who probably already own property or have an outbuilding where that's not an issue. So that, that would be a huge benefit. Um, but time, you know, ha one of my biggest costs was simply my time. I spent three Three years after I started, so I spent two years just studying and being a stay-at-home dad, starting a, a business plan, um, and so that was free, you know, I didn't pay myself, that made no money. <laughs> um, we lived off of my wife's student loans and the sale of our house and her being a teacher, which was very little for a long period of time. Um, so there was that, and then the three years after I started extracting, every penny went back into back went back into paying for you know uh, food and the snakes, rent for the warehouse, and, and any other business expense. The the expenses, um, you know, there's a whole long list, and off the top of my head, I can't even think of everything. But when I first started, I had a, I found a warehouse that had been dilapidated, <laughs> um, and I made a deal with the owner. If I refurbished the warehouse, they would give me two months free rent. So for those two months, I had free rent, and I had to have a set of dominoes fall perfectly um, you know I had my first customer say all right I'm gonna give you a chance which looking back today I think that is the most insane thing ever to have someone say yeah I'm gonna have you give you a chance to provide them even though you don't even have rattlesnakes and you have no experience um, extracting and you have no experience processing venom um, I, I was incredibly lucky and fortunate to have had that occur. But the minute he said, okay, I'll give you a chance, I had to sign the warehouse, sign the lease for the warehouse. I had to get the city um, to okay the warehouse. So I had to paint everything and refurbish everything in the warehouse myself. The city made uh, made me build a containment room within the warehouse, so I had to teach myself how to do um, framing and construction. Um, so I constructed and framed a containment room with a door and everything, making sure that it was all sealed up. Um, and I placed orders for the racks, orders for the equipment. In the meantime, I, ha I was trying to find people who could get me enough rattlesnakes um, and get them up to Colorado from Texas. And um, finding a way to ethically do that, because sure, there'd be a lot of people who would be willing to <laughs> gas snakes even, mm -hmm. which is a horrible, horrible practice. Uh, it, it's awful. Um, but finding guys who have access to enough snakes. I I had all of that stuff ready and put into place and then the snakes I, I went and got, put them in place. 
then I did my first extractions. I had the equipment that I had never used to process the venom. I got enough process to ship to the customer and get them to say, yeah, that's okay, that'll work for us. Um, and once I got that back, I had to then get enough sent back to them and get paid for it just in time to make my first warehouse payment, which was barely enough. I, looking back, I, I don't know how it worked. I, I don't. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, so then for the next three years, I was just slowly, slowly, slowly getting enough to buy another rack, get more snakes, and to where I could finally start paying myself after, you know, into my fourth year, mm -hmm. which was still very, very little. And so that is the biggest cost, is living off of nothing for so long. And um, getting to a point where you can pay yourself is really, 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 really difficult. I guess that would lead into the next question is – once you finally get to that that phase, you're you're stabilized. You have a recurring uh, customer base. You got enough specimens to keep the production going. Is this something you can make a pretty good living at? Is this something? I guess two questions: Can you do well? And the other question is: For people who watch TV, can you get rich doing it? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know that you can get rich doing it. Um, I, after about five, my, in my fifth year, I was able to call it a living. And after about my sixth year, I was able to say, you know, I was able to exhale and say, okay, you know what? Now, because my wife still works. Um, luckily, she has a, work, a job working from home where she has some flexibility. And if something were to happen to my job, our family would be okay. Yeah, so... Finally, after about six years, I make enough to where nobody needs to feel sorry for me. But it, I don't think it'll ever be enough to where anybody wants to envy how much money I make. It's enough to make a living. Um, the, the thing that I, I guess I love about it is that I have the flexibility to work for myself, to do what I'm passionate about. And um, and just do something that I enjoy. I absolutely love just feeding the snakes. That's so much fun. Um, and taking care of them. Seeing a snake that uh, isn't doing so well was, you know, wild caught. A lot of my snakes came from relocations where they were in a neighborhood here locally. And there's no good place for them to be relocated. So they come into my lab and then and and then they're nervous and they don't eat it takes a long time to get them wanting to eat and getting used to being captive and you know to no fault of their own they did not choose to be captive so i try to keep that in mind and just take as good a care of them as i possibly can um but seeing them go from struggling and not being <laughs> very happy about being captive to a point where they're thriving and they're eating every single rat and they're calming down. They don't always calm down. People always ask me, so do they ever start calming down? Um, some of them, no, they will never calm down. They will always be crazy. Um, and then others, there was one that I thought would be, you know, I thought he'd probably kill me someday, but he, um, he just calmed down. I, I seemed like overnight. Like one, one day I pulled him out to extract, and instead of throwing himself at me, he was just really calm. I was like, okay, we can do this. I'm fine with that. But, you know, the, the most important thing to always remember as a snake keeper, venomous handler, is never, ever, ever assume that they're just going to be calm. Always treat every single specimen like he's your worst one um, when it comes to behavior and attitude. So, you know, doing work like this has got, I mean, even if you have to get used to it, it's probably a high stress kind of thing. You're always having to be real tense and ultra focused. What keeps you motivated to keep doing this? Is it just the career? 
itself or is it or like financially speaking or is it the love of what you do uh what what keeps you you know wanting to get out of bed every day and go out and extract venom yeah um that's a great question and i think that you know everybody's brains are wired differently um it just so happens that this doesn't stress me out at all um i i don't feel stressed when i'm extracting we're working with the snakes i feel calm I, I love it. I feel happy. It's yeah. So I, I don't <laughs> think about, I don't think in those terms. Um, it's not stressful at all. I enjoy it. Well, that's a good problem to have, yeah, isn't I it? <laughs> Doing that for a living. So good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so is this like an occupation that you would want friends or family to do? Would this be something you would encourage or is it something you just like, you know, just leave it into the hands of us few? Yeah, that's a great question, and I guess I could answer that in two parts. One is I would never want to see my friends extracting venom or family, people that I cared about, simply because, you know, you see the potential for hazard. You see the potential for something really bad happening. So anyone you love, you don't want to see them in that position. And so for that, I empathize with my parents and my wife, knowing that that's probably what they're seeing. Um, so. You know, I, I guess I feel bad that I'm putting them in that position. Um, but me telling someone else, no, you can't do that, um, it, it would be totally, totally wrong and, and hypocritical of me. Um, I, I'll never tell someone else, you can't do that. I'll never tell someone you can't follow your dream, and I'll never tell someone you can't do what I'm doing <laughs> because I'm doing, you know, you know how that works. I, I would definitely not recommend someone to venture out into this without experience like I did. I'm not proud of that, um, but I'm not really embarrassed either. It's, it's just is what it is. It was the nature of the situation. It was the only way that it could happen. I felt like I was born to do this, and that was kind of the way it was going to be. Um, and out of respect to the other um, venom producers who I know worked their butts off to get where they are and to be successful and to make their operations work. You know, they aren't in a position where, oh, yeah, let me show you how to become my competitor, you know. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't be right, you know. That wouldn't be respectful either. So um, they were always very kind in the aspect of, here are some ways, you know, here's some advice on how to not get bit. And for that, you know, I think every venomous keeper should always be totally open with, you know, here's some tips on how to take better care of the animals, how to better handle the animals so you don't get bit. But as far as um, here's how, who's, who's, here's the people that I sell venom to. Here's how to process the venom and here's, how to operate the business so you can be my competitor. Yeah, that's counterintuitive. The market's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the market's really small, and um, it doesn't change very much. I think that um, I was fortunate when I was interested in entering the market, there happened to be a very, very small but yet significant need that I – immediately filled and so at the moment the market is once again kind of saturated if you will um but it, it things can change overnight there's always um changes with the uh the way just scientific discoveries that are made the fda approves things there could be a new need um that there wasn't the day before and so that's always interesting to follow how that develops yeah see a lot of people don't realize yeah, that I, they don't just use snake venoms for making anti-venom they use it for research things it, it's 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 the world is or the sky's the limit for snake venom research they're doing all kinds of things with it every day so uh, yeah a lot of people don't realize that that's what another thing another aspect of the business but um so getting away from extracting a little bit do you have a favorite snake species you know, I, I, I have a special love for Aatrox because 
um, the Western Diamondback because that's what I work mostly with. But I love um, the uh, Ornatus, the uh, Blacktail, Eastern Blacktail rattlesnakes are gorgeous. Transpecos rat snakes are gorgeous. Snakes from West Texas are absolutely beautiful. Um, growing up, I had a fascination with, of course, the Amazon tree boa or the green and the green tree pythons. They're both amazing, beautiful species. Uh, I love seeing reticulated pythons. They are so beautiful. Uh, just any snake that's right in front of me. Dumeril's boas were always um, some of my favorites from a long time ago. Um, gaboon vipers are so pretty. I don't have any gaboon vipers. I don't have any king cobras. I think my collection to a lot of um, herpeticulturists are, they would probably think my collection is kind of boring. I don't know. But it's, it's mostly native species that uh, people from around here when they come visit the lab can see the difference between a bull snake and a rattlesnake. They can see a coach whip. Oh, that's a rat snake. That's a coach whip. That's a king snake. And, and that's great. Um, but there's a lot of exotics that I would love to keep. Um, but I think that being a keeper, you got to know your, uh, your limits <laughs> as far as how many snakes you can really take care of before it starts to be detrimental to the snake. So learn how to say no <laughs> when you're at a snake show buying snakes or at the pet store. Learn how to be like, you know, do I really need that snake? No, it's not about me and fulfilling the fantasy of having this beautiful snake in a terrarium in my room. It's, it's you know, think about it a little bit more, I think, to those people who are wanting to get a snake or add to their collection. It probably doesn't make sense for you from a business standpoint to be getting a bunch of ones and twos of exotics. It's not going to be enough to really extract from and sell. So, I mean, you're probably just looking at a loss unless you've got a certain, you know, a big number of them. And once again, you're looking at problems of space and husbandry and, and all that. So, yeah, probably is, I'd probably just focus like you do, <laughs> you know, and be specialist. Yeah, you know, and, and to be honest, I get emails every other day from someone else um, saying, hey, do you want to buy scorpion venom or do you want to buy king cobra venom or do you want to buy this kind of venom or that kind of venom? And I don't buy any venom. I don't have a need for venom right now. Um, and, and that kind of speaks to how much venom is really out there. There's plenty of venom being provided in, in different parts of the world. Um, but that always changes. Yeah, ebbs and flows, yeah. ebbs and yeah. flows, right? Uh, so is there any message you'd like to get out there to the general public about uh, snakes in general and venomous snakes in particular? You know, snakes in general, uh, venomous snakes in particular, if, if you could snap your fingers and help the general public not be afraid of them, that would be great. But it takes a... A long and it's a long, slow process, and being patient with uh, the general public who doesn't understand snakes uh, goes a long way. And hearing them out, and hearing them express their fears, and then not shaming them for it, but saying, "Okay, I understand where you're coming from. Let me tell you a little bit about snakes," because I think that fear in general really comes from not understanding something and having ambiguity in their mind where they don't understand what might happen if they got bit. They're just hearing stories from their, their grandpa or from the pioneer days where they got bit and they cut their leg open and sucked out the venom and then, and then they died. And, you know, they think, Oh, all those crazy things. Um, but you know, Obviously, let me address that in case there's someone who's listening. Don't ever cut and suck on a snake bite. Don't ever put any kind of uh, restrictive bandage. Don't use a tourniquet on a snake bite. You just leave it alone and stay calm. Get yourself to a hospital or have someone drive you, obviously, is better. Um, or call 911. But they say the set of, a set of keys is the best 
first aid for a snake bite. Get yourself to the ER where they can get anti-venom to you, and and you'll you'll be okay. Um, so just addressing and seeing, explaining to these people, okay, here's how venom works. Yeah, it's necrotic. It does bad things to you. It has neurotoxins, and those can do bad things to you. This and but once they get that education and then learn how all these different peptides and enzymes can be useful for science and medicine, they're like, you know what, that's kind of interesting. And then they start to appreciate that these animals are fascinating and they're complicated and they're necessary for the ecosystem. They're necessary for this world. And they can be, they, you can still be afraid of it, um, and have a healthy respect for it, that's great. But hating those reptiles <laughs> and gassing them and exterminating them is completely unnecessary and over the top. Um, but I guess just knowing the details of what happens when there's a snake bite, knowing more about these reptiles helps subside the fears that people have. Yeah, I, 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 when you say that, I remember the old snake bite kit we used to have when we were camping. It was a stupid little, uh, looked like a big capsule, and it had a little razor blade in it, and it had the, the uh, how you cut the X in it and suck the poison out. That ridiculousness that uh, they used to teach us as norm up until like the 80s and late 80s, you know, so it's kind of ingrained in the public subconsciousness. But Yeah, you know, and it, it's kind of intuitive you would think that if you suck on a wound you might pull something out but the reality is that the venom is very gooey and sticky and it gets in your system it pretty much stays there not to mention the fact if you uh you know have a cut or something in your mouth that you just expedited the process a little bit and yeah so absolutely yeah yeah uh, it, it, uh, you make a great point too when you educate people i make it a point not to denigrate what they think and if they start telling anecdotal stories about the the cotton mouth who chases people on horseback it's like you know you got to ease that back it's like oh yeah i know i've heard those stories too but you know here's the reality of the situation here's what really happens don't don't make them defensive because they won't listen to you i find it much easier to yeah, yeah, just kind of true. gently steer them the other direction and like you said having them hold a smaller snake or a calmer snake to see hey these things aren't slimy they're not out to bite you they're not out to attack you you know this is how they normally live in the wild uh you know, just a little more calm than people think. People think they're like jaws running around all the time, you know, eating constantly and, and darting around. Like, you know, only if you're a few, very few snake species that are actually really active that much, you know, like they're imagining. But uh, I got off on a tangent there. But, yeah, so, yeah, education's key, and uh, I try to do it all the time. There's a – I did an interview a while ago with the uh, – have you heard the uh, application called Snake Snap? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did an uh, interview with those guys. You know, it's a great little thing. I encourage anyone out there who doesn't have a real good knowledge of snakes to put that on your phone. It's a free app. And if you have a question, rather than just killing a snake outright, snap a picture of it, see what you get back, and then almost nine times out of ten, that's not going to be any problem for you. But <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But, uh, yeah, just get out there and get educated on snakes. Uh, there are there are friends. They're very necessary to have in our environment and uh, be a much, much, much worse off place in the world without them. So... We're going to go ahead and start wrapping the show up here. I know you got a busy day ahead of you. Uh, is there any other messages you want to get out there? Anything else you want to plug before uh, we go our separate ways today? Can't think of anything. I appreciate your uh, talking to me. Oh, I definitely appreciate you having you and, and you spend this time. Uh, we've been talking back and forth for quite a while. And once again, it's helped me uh, complete the, compl uh, the collection of people who do this amazing thing that almost no one knows about, you know. Uh, people tend to think it's like, well, the only places snakes are kept are in the zoo or in the private home. But, you know, there's there's facilities like yours out there who work with these animals every day, day in, day out. And it's all done basically for the betterment of mankind at the end of the day, either through research or anti-venom. So I think people like you need to be highlighted a lot more than you are. And, uh, you know, I don't know, just given, <laughs> given the little kudos that you probably don't hear enough. So uh, thanks for what oh, you thanks. do out there. Thank you. So, uh Yep. Uh, now, is there any websites that they can go to? People can go to to see your your uh, laboratory and what you do. Oh, you know, it's funny. Part of the part of my starting my business all by myself was my creating my own crappy little website and my own home homemade logo. <laughs> so they can go to venetox.com. 
or you know, find me on Facebook. I love uh, interacting with people on Facebook or whatever, Rob Clark. Uh, it, it's not hard to find uh, other people that like snakes on Facebook. So, Yeah, the internet certainly has uh, helped people uh, kind of connect in that in that little field, that's for sure. Uh, I know you also have a YouTube page too as well. I saw you have a few videos up there. So, yeah. so great. great. Uh, go check out uh, his stuff. And once again, if you uh, ever meet someone who has ever had the dis- misfortune of being bitten by a snake and survived, you know, you can thank uh, guys like Mr. Clark for, you know, taking uh, risk of their own life and limb to, you know, bring these products to you. So, uh, Rob, once again, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Um, I want to encourage everyone out there to get educated on snakes a little bit. I mean, you don't have to love them, but you don't have to fear them either. So, uh, they don't mean you any ill will and, uh, miss, I don't know, reach out and shake hands with the snake sometime if you know what it is. So, uh, <laughs> uh until next time, this is Genome and Rob Clark out. Thank you. Thank you.